Hey, this is Bill here at PowerStrokeHelp.com here again with Tom Brown, Certified Lubrication Specialist. Gotta make sure I say that right. You know, the man worked hard for certification. I'm gonna, it's, I, at least I can do is pronounce it correctly. Um, Tom is here to talk about coolant testing. We're not going to talk about the specific differences between different types of coolant. That's not what this discussion is about. But he's going to talk about how to test coolant, the different methodologies of testing the coolant, and the significance of why coolant testing is important. Power Stroke specialty in, in terms of working with the fleets and whatnot, we've kept to a 50,000 mile drain and fill interval, okay, using Ford products only. There was a lot of problems with coolants back in the early 2000s uh, between the different formulations that then when you mix them or you mix them with uh, ethylene glycol, uh, it would turn to glue inside your uh, coolant system. A lot of that, of course, all that has been solved at this point, you know, many years later. At that point, because of the fleet applications we were working on, we, th we made the decision to just change the coolant at 50,000, use only Ford coolant, uh, you, you, we would drain it, we would fill it up with water, we'd close the Pepcock, fill it up with water, drain it again, and then fill it with coolant and send them on down the road. We've had no troubles uh, out of any of the fleet in terms of any breakdown of any of the, the solders or the metals or anything inside of the coolant systems. Of course, there's always a cavitation issue with the 6.4s, uh, especially if you let your uh, coolant levels get down, but that's not a function of the coolant itself. There's people get, I get emails all day long about cat coolant. I have no opinion about cat coolant. I don't run cat coolant. There's folks that, uh, that say it's great stuff. That's not what the scope of this is. The scope of this is, is how to test the coolant. Tom? All right, thanks Bill. Yes sir. All right, the first couple things I want to talk about here today is testing methods that almost all of you have probably seen, at least the first one. Very simple, very cheap, but not very effective, uh, not very accurate. All you do is with your coolant, uh, safe enough to open the radiator cap is stick this little tester down in there, suck up some of the coolant and read the number of balls that are floating uh, in the solution and come back to your chart here on the, the pocket protector. You can actually see them over here on the side of this gauge as well. So if you've got uh, all the balls floating that means you're down at minus 40 Fahrenheit uh, and you're also at a plus 271 boiling point and then as the number of balls that is floating reduces, I mean that you've got one or more balls sitting down here at the bottom, then that means that your freeze point is higher so, uh, or your, and your boiling point is lower. Uh, so if you but if you end up with all of the balls floating or not floating down here at the bottom, they're all stuck at the bottom, you're at a very unsafe condition because you're basically just slightly below uh, the freeze point and your boil point is only at about 255 degrees. Uh, so your cooling system at that point, your coolant, needs servicing. Now, one of the things I said about this method is that it's not very efficient or accurate. Uh, it's not very efficient or accurate in terms of measuring the actual freeze and boil point because it's all based on your eyeballing those little balls. But the other problem is is that it only checks the freeze and boil point. You've got several other factors that are going on inside your coolant. You've got a, a, a cavitation control issue, you've got a corrosion control issue, uh, and the pH balance that's in your system. This is not going to tell you any of that. This is only going to tell you what your freeze and boil point is. They're usually about five dollars or less. It's fast because it'll give you instant results, but it's not so good. Uh, not that accurate, and it's only checking one thing, which is your freeze and boil point. The next one that I want to talk about, and it's called a refractometer. Uh, it is a much more accurate version of the pocket tester. Uh, it is uh, very accurate for testing the freeze and boil point. But it does not, and it is fast, because you'll get nearly instant results, basically as fast as you can read the little scale in the telescope. Not so cheap, they're around $50, so you can get them a little cheaper sometimes, but that's a good average price there for a good one. So this is what a refractometer uh, looks like. So you lift up this little uh, lid right here, you put a couple drops of water on there, close the lid back down, calibrate it to zero, wipe that off, then put a couple of drops of coolant on there, close it back down, 
look up in there, read the gauge, and it will tell you the freeze uh, boil point very accurately for your coolant. These are, were really used a lot more over in some other industrial applications, uh, and they've been used in the automotive coolant world uh, to very accurately check the freeze and boil point. But again, you're not getting the other checks that we want to talk about. Okay, the third coolant testing procedure that I wanted to cover over here is coolant testing strips. And these have become one of my favorite uh, coolant testing uh, methods. Uh, they're good in the sense of the best ones are capable of checking four different things or aspects of your coolant. Like the previous two, they will check the freeze and boil point. Uh, they will also check the pH level of your coolant and we're looking for a pH level of somewhere between 7 and 8 as your desired pH level of your coolant. Because that's what's going to start telling us about whether you have acid forming in your coolant. Uh, the third thing it'll check is nitrates. And nitrates are used in coolant to control cavitation. And cavitation can cause big problems, as Bill was mentioning earlier, especially on the 6.4 engines in the water pump and front cover, just because of the way the water pump, where it's placed on the engine, and the size of the water pump impeller being so large, the outer edges of that uh, impeller are moving very quickly and they tend to generate a lot of air bubbles if the system is not completely full or if you don't have good cavitation control. Cavitation is basically air bubbles forming in the coolant and then as the coolant flows through the engine, those air bubbles are like little bombs. As they hit up against pieces of aluminum or metal, they just keep pounding against that uh, surface and it eventually it just erodes away the either the aluminum or the metal. And the last thing, the molly level, and that is for corrosion control. When we checked up here for pH, we were just checking the overall pH level, but the molly B date uh, additive is what's actually doing the, the acid reduction or acid control. So we're checking that level as well. Now be careful because there's several different types of test strips on the market. So you want to make sure you're getting ones that's checking the things that you want to check. A lot of them are designed purely for automotive use and not necessarily for diesel engines. And so they will only check the first two. They'll check the freeze point and they'll check the pH of the coolant. And they won't check these other two. So if you want to check these other two areas, make sure the test strip you get uh, is covering both of those. Basically it is just a little strip of plastic with uh, two, three, or four little colored pads on there. You dip it down in your coolant and you wait about a minute to two minutes based on the instructions and you read the color of those pads against a chart that comes with them. Very effective. They're cheap. They're less than ten dollars usually for a package of about six of them and they're fast. It takes less than five minutes to do all this. So these are quickly becoming one of my favorite methods. The great thing about using a test strip is let's say you have a vehicle in the repair shop and you're not sure of the condition of the coolant. You don't know whether it needs to be serviced or not, but the owner wants that truck back quickly or you know you want to get your own truck back on the road quickly. Some of these other tests, they're either not complete, so they're not going to give you all the information that you need, or as we'll see in the full fluid analysis, on the, which will be under number four, it takes about a week to get your results back. That's why I like the coolant test strips because you can nearly instantly get enough information to know whether you need to do a service on your coolant or not. Whether you need to add more SCA or if you need to go ahead and do a full drain and refill or flush and refill depending upon the condition of your coolant. So the last coolant testing method that I want to talk about today is the most thorough as you can see here and this is coolant analysis. This is very similar to oil analysis. You're simply going to fill up a small test bottle like this with about three ounces of your coolant mixture, put the cap on it, seal it up just like you do an oil analysis test. You're going to put a little label on the bottle and you're going to send it off to the laboratory. I happen to have a little AMSOIL uh, pump here that you can even screw the bottles onto and you run a hose right over into your radiator or over into your coolant tank. Uh, make sure you're pulling this from the radiator and not just a uh, recovery tank. Now a lot of vehicles have 
a, uh, just look and see wherever your radiator cap is. Wherever the cap is located is where you can pull it from. It provides all of these tests right here. Freeze and boil point, just like the other ones did. pH level to know the uh, acid level in your coolant. It checks, here's some of the other things it does check though that the other ones didn't. Talks about, gives you information about corrosion metals. If your pH level starts to get too acidic, your coolant is going to start turning into an acid and it's going to start attacking the cooling system. It's going to start attacking the radiator, it's going to start attacking the water pump, it's going to start attacking the heater core. That's why your heater core goes bad usually first because it's the weakest link in your whole system. Unfortunately, usually the hardest to get to as well to repair or replace. The other thing that the coolant analysis can do is talk, you know, show you information about corrosion inhibitors. Uh, we were seeing some of that information on the test strips, but they're going to give you a lot more information. Uh, there's salts in there that they're checking for. They're checking for other contaminants as well. Do you have oil in your coolant that's getting in there through a leak inside your engine? Do you have uh, uh, blow-by gases or combustion gases uh, that are in your coolant because you've got a leaking head gasket. Um, one of the other very important things they're checking for is water hardness. Um, I know a lot of people when they service their cooling system they dump in straight coolant and then just grab a garden hose or whatever or tap water right out of the sink and fill it up the rest of the way. The problem is most city water or rural water is too hard for your cooling system. So the first thing that has to happen when you put that mixture together is that the inhibitor and additive package that is inside your coolant has to go in there and immediately start softening that water or that water will turn into scale inside of your system and, and it'll coat the inside of your cooling system and make it less effective. That's why I always recommend if when you do cooling system services use distilled water you can also use the pre-diluted antifreeze because it's made with distilled water, but there are some concerns about that, making sure you can get the proper mixture uh, in some engines. The major drawback of the coolant analysis process is that it's slow. It takes about a week to get your turnaround, to get your results back. So you can't have a vehicle down and know instantly whether or not uh, it needs to have a cooling system service. Um, I put not cheap, they're about $30 plus or minus depending on where you get them for one test kit which will do one cooling system. Next thing I want to cover is the coolant analysis form that you would use to submit your sample. If you've watched our uh, videos on doing an oil analysis this is very similar. It's going to be going to the same place. They're looking for the same type of information they want to know about you they want to know uh, about your, your coolant, whether it's used, new, uh, diluted, or a concentrate. How long has the coolant been in the vehicle? Miles, kilometers, hours, days, months, or years, however you want to measure that. Uh, they want to know about how many uh, hours or miles are on the engine, in this case. And if you're doing uh, supplemental coolant additives, SCAs, uh, they want to know if you have added any of that and how much uh, and if you've changed the coolant at the time of this uh, sample or not and if you have a filter, an SCA filter, if you've changed that or not. Um, so again, that, that, that's all the information we're looking up here. Very similar to what you would be using uh, or the information you would be submitting for an oil sample. Uh, down here you would do the first time you're going to register this component uh, you're telling them what uh, what type of coolant you're using, whether it's a conventional, an organic, a hybrid, or if you're asking them to do some advanced testing, but if you do that you're going to be paying some extra money as well. And then what type of an application, and most of the people we're talking about here, you're doing automotive. Um, and then the coolant manufacturer, you know, whether you're using Xerox or whether you're using Caterpillar or Ford or whatever and what the product name is, so like if you were using Ford, then maybe you're using Ford Gold, so you put that over here, and then the total capacity of your cooling system. So you're going to submit that in with the sample, the little bottle right here, uh, that will go along in with the bottle, and what you're going to do is you're going to take this uh, 
sticker right here and it says apply to sample jar so you're going to apply that right there and there's the tracking number and then you keep this barcode right here for your records because it's got that same tracking number on there that's going to be on the bottle and then you're going to pick one of these return address labels whichever one is closest to you it doesn't really matter they're all going to be tested by the same testing procedures they just have three laboratories across the country so wherever which one's closest to you and one thing that I won't get into today but it is possible and very efficient and effective for you to pre-register all of your samples online through a program called Horizon. Now this is an oil analyzers which is part of AMSOIL but oil analyzers utilizes Polaris kits uh, so you're still going back to Polaris labs. Okay so then the last things that I want to show you here today are what you will get back from the laboratory when you submit a coolant analysis test sample. So after you have submitted your little bottle and mailed that into the lab, about a week later you're going to receive an email if you've given them an email address that will contain a PDF copy of, of a report like this. But over here on the left hand side this is a good report. As you can see up here at the top we have a green zero highlighted for normal over here on the left hand side is going to be the information about you over here in the middle is the information about the component that we're checking so in this case it would be your vehicles uh, cooling system and then over here on the right side is the uh, sample information you know the, the coolant that you submitted into them in the bottle tracking number uh, the date you pulled it the date they received it and the date they sent it back to you that and then down here you're going to tell them about your coolant like in this case, this was an AMSOIL ANT antifreeze and engine coolant. It's important that they know exactly what coolant that you're using so that they know what the baseline or new specifications of this coolant would be uh, to compare your used coolant to. So you got to tell them that. Um, now the comments here are going to come back from the lab. This is very similar to an oil analysis report. The comments are going to come back and they're going to tell you if there's anything they found that's unusual and any recommendations that they're making. In this case, nothing was wrong. Coolant looked good, keep on going. But what you're going to find down here is, uh, here's that sample information again, that you provided them this information. What day you sampled it, what day the lab received it, how long had this coolant been in use. In this case, it had been in use for two years. How long had the unit been in uh, service? In this case, this truck had been in service for 11,096 miles. Uh, did they change the coolant at the time of this sample? Yes, they did. Uh, I think there's an error on this one because it says they added seven gallons of SCA, or supplemental coolant additives. That doesn't make sense. I think what they're saying is, is that the total system holds seven gallons. What you should be telling them here is, if you've added any supplemental coolant additives uh, during the life of this coolant. So that would probably be measured in pints or ounces. Uh, did you change the, the coolant filter? Yes, they did. Uh, and now we're going to get into the corrosion metals. And as you can see across here, iron, aluminum, copper, lead, tin, silver, zinc, and titanium. As we talked about earlier, if your coolant starts to turn acidic, it will start attacking the cooling system and it will start pulling some of these uh, corrosion metals away from uh, the system and they'll start floating around in the coolant and so then the coolant analysis can capture that. Uh, we've also got a measurement for contaminants calcium and magnesium these are things that are getting into the coolant from somewhere else uh, now we're also going to look at the corrosion inhibitors so we've, we've got an additive package just like we have in automotive or uh, oil that helps control corrosion. So the lab is going to take a look and see uh, how your corrosion inhibitors are doing. Uh, same way with carrier salts. Uh, carrier salts are a major fun a component of your antifreeze additive package. Uh, they also did a visual test down here of this coolant. There was no foam present. The color was clear blue. There was no oil present, there was no fuel present, there was no magnetic or non-magnetic precipitate floating in the uh, coolant, and it had no unusual odor to it. 
Then they came down and did some basic testing on it. So they checked the freeze point, so we're down at minus 27 Fahrenheit on this one, that's good. Uh, they checked the boil point at 225, that's not pressurized by the way. Uh, they checked the percent of antifreeze and we're right on where we should be at 50%. Uh, so, and then we also checked the pH level of the water and it's at 8.3, so that's very good. Uh, the water hardness was at 27 parts per million, so that's good. Nitrates, they checked by strip dip method, uh, so they even used those test strips in the laboratory and the nitrate part per million was 95 and that's good for this antifreeze and they checked for specific conductance. Uh, that's the ability of the antifreeze to conduct electricity, which you really don't want it to be able to do. Not a problem here and this, at, this coolant does not utilize an SCA additive, so there was none present and this test did not check for carbolic acid nothing unusual nothing abnormal keep on going now let's come over here to the one on the right your right side we've got a red flag four meaning that we need to take immediate action significant comments here and i won't go through all of these but they have actually established a trend or a profile on this particular piece of equipment they've got three different tests on record they changed coolant halfway through here on this second test, but we've still got problems going on. We've got flags all over the place. This coolant is in bad condition and needs to be serviced. Probably need to flush the entire system and refill it with clean coolant and distilled water. We've got problems with copper and lead uh, from corrosion because the acid level got too high. We've got contaminants that are getting in there. We've got a funky color. We've got magnetic precipitate floating in the, the coolant. We've also got water hardness getting out of control, which means that the water softeners that are part of the coolant additive package are depleted. So the, the coolant or the additives can no longer control the water hardness, which is going to lead to some of the, the uh, flaking and the coating inside of the system, which will cause your cooling system to lose effectiveness. So this is really bad condition. It was actually the same antifreeze, uh, the Amsoil ANT. They just ran it too long or didn't take care of it or it got air in it is, is a, a, a very likely source is that this system had a leak and it was allowing air. They may have allowed the coolant level to get too low. Air comes into the system, starts causing all kinds of problems. So here we have a really good complete picture and we know that this system needs to be serviced immediately. So I wanted to summarize real quick what we've talked about today under coolant testing. We talked about the pocket tester, which was just that little cheap $5 floating ball test. It's, it's quick, it's easy, but it doesn't give you a very accurate or enough information. It is fast. It, these are about $50, so they're not necessarily cheap, but it doesn't give you enough information either. Test strips. Little plastic test strips. I don't have any here today, but I'll get some and come back and do another video on those because they deserve their own video. They're cheap, they're very good, and they're fast. They give you enough information to know whether or not you need to do a service that day. But the granddaddy of all, the one that's going to give you the most information is the coolant analysis where you send off that sample bottle, just like you do an oil sample to the lab. It's going to give you the most complete picture, kind of like a blood test to the doctor, about $30 and it takes about a week. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to all of these. So in summary, maintaining your cooling system is vitally important. Uh, studies have shown that upwards of 50% of all engine failures are coolant related because people did not maintain their coolant properly or they did something to it that was incorrect like put in the wrong coolant or didn't put in supplemental coolant additives when they needed to or didn't maintain the proper the coolant level. So cooling system maintenance is critical, especially for a diesel engine. Your diesel engine puts a lot more stress on the coolant than a gasoline engine does, uh, and so you really gotta take care of it, just like the oil side of it. Also, if you're watching my videos, 
and you're not watching them on PowerStrokeHelp.com, you're really missing where the action is. You need to go to the website PowerStrokeHelp.com and check us out because there's a lot of information on there that could be very useful to you as a Power Stroke owner to keep your truck on the road as long as possible. Remember, if you press the Arch Oil button, all the proceeds from Arch Oil uh, go to help train a vet, the nonprofit organization that I run, to help veterans ease their way back into civilian life. Thank you for all your support for making PowerStrokeHelp.com the number one stop for power stroke owners on the internet.